In late December, I got told of another World War II veteran coming to Joint Base Lewis McQuarrie. So I thought, why not go? Why not listen to this man's story? And I was glad I did. I even invited my good friend, Chris. Here's Chris. Hi, I'm Chris. I'm a tour guide here in the Pacific Northwest, and I cover a lot of the interesting stories in the area. Chris does cover a lot of interesting stories, but I have never met a more colorful veteran like Captain Stuart Boot Gordon. An amazing World War II veteran and Korean War veteran, he had another amazing story to tell. It's hard to believe that this generation did the things it did and are so genuinely humble about them. So with that said, sit back and enjoy this discussion with Captain Stuart Boot Gordon. sits down and you continue standing. You're the tallest one in the room. <laughs> and that's the same. I think I'm the last of the damn Mohegans, see. <laughs> so do you have a favorite? Did you, a fav did you have a favorite airplane? Yeah, that, the P-63 was my favorite airplane, yeah. Why, why was that? That was a King Cobra. It looked like a P-39, a different tail. Instead of having a Curtis tail, it had a little bit higher tail. Four blades of crop, and it had turbo supercharger. And it was a beautiful plane to fly. Yeah, I think one of the original um, astronauts uh, bought one, fixed it up, and flew it around. Yeah, it was. Uh, but the P-38 was my real favorite because it saved my life a couple of times. So I flew the P-38, the P-39, P-47, of course, it's the, the uh, uh, Republic Thunderbolt. And then I flew the, the P-51 and the, and the uh, F-80. That's about the last airplane. The F-80, as you know, was the airplane that, that Richard Ball, who was a number one ace in World War II, he was killed in an F-80. And uh, maybe one of the best pilots that ever lived was, was Milo Bertram. He was the test pilot for Lockheed. He was killed in an F-80. I think what they discovered was that there was a leak in the, in the fuel tank and uh, where they put the fuel in, and it was leaking into the engine, and that's why they, they all died. They died. Anyway, but it was it was a nice airplane. Except, you know, once you once you flew a a jet, it was going so fast it was like flying on a it wasn't like like flying a, a regular airplane. It was acrobatics. It was it was a different different thing. All right, um, we'll go ahead and officially yeah. start, sir. If you're ready, they're going to introduce you. Yeah, we'll we'll introduce you here. All right. I, I'm so old that uh, when, I, when I get a bottle of milk, I got to shake the thing. And I, I, I'm so old that uh, I pick up a telephone, and I expect a lady to say, 
number, please. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably so old that, uh, I, actually, I remember that the delivering the milk on, on my horse-drawn sleighs, and I could still hear the squeak of the sleighs. And, uh, anyway, but I'm really so old that I would rather have a BM than a, get some, <laughs> now that's really old. <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> Uh, we we were sent, we were all volunteered. Everybody by one. Nobody wanted to go to war in, in before before Pearl Harbor. See, but uh, what happened, of course, was that the <coughs> the Japanese invaded. Of course, we had nine uh, warnings that the Japanese fleet was on its way, and we definitely know that the nine. At least nine, and um, Secretary of uh, the Navy and Secretary of the Army, of course, the Army uh, and uh, Roosevelt. They all knew that the Japanese were coming, but because it was it was such a surprise that America really wanted to go to war. So I would say it started out with maybe one. Tenth of the people of the United States interested in fighting went from almost 100 percent. It was just amazing. People just went running down and joined the army and joined the Marines and uh, and so forth. It was uh, it was it, so everybody. Uh, if you didn't join, y you were you were kind of an outcast. And so it was it, it was amazing how how popular it was once it once that. Pearl Harbor happened. Um, and a close friend, I was just used to teach, I used to uh, deliver papers, and there's one kid maybe four or five old years older than I was, and he would always, uh, when I'd go to collect uh, for the paper, he would always invite me in and get me about three martinis, and I'd stagger home, and his mother would say, you're supposed to give Boone a, a drink? I think he's 16 or 14, I don't think he's, anyway. so. Um, but uh, this kid ended up in Guadalcanal. And Guadalcanal, as you know, is a little dinky island in the south of uh, New Guinea. And if the Japanese, they were building this field, and we heard about it, and we went down there and captured it, of course, and then finished the field, and the Japanese wanted to take it. And the Japanese knew, they said, you know, we're gonna get it. We're, we're gonna defeat, because we defeated the the, the the Russian Navy in World War One, and we defeated the the British at, at Singapore, and we beat the, the Americans at, in, in, in the Philippines, and uh, so we're going to take uh, uh, Guadalcanal, and of course they never did. Uh, and that was a really important, one of the most important battles, and that's where my squadron operated out of, uh, the the seventieth squadron that was shooting down Admiral Yamamoto. You probably know about that story, but uh, I, I wasn't on that mission, but I did talk to Barber, who was the one that, that shot down Admiral Yamamoto. Uh, an interesting flight. Uh, I went to, so I joined the Army, and, and uh, I was called up in about February of 1943, and um, uh, uh, we went to uh, went to uh, St. Louis, Missouri, to the base boot training boot boot camp, and uh, they didn't know we were coming. Something like five thousand civilians, right? And no bedding. All we had to sleep on was these springs, and no no mattresses, and uh, little Quonset huts. But actually, they were little little pure, little uh, boxes made out of plywood. They were very they were really cold. And no uniform. We thought it would be warm in, in Missouri. We were from Minnesota, and so we didn't pre work prepared. We got down there next to the Mississippi River. Within two weeks, we were all coughing up blood, and we were all, it was really every day, uh, uh, every couple hours, a, a, a um, ambulance would come up, a meat wagon, pick, carry some people. Anyway, I don't know how many people we lost there, but it was all I know that we were all coughing up blood. Uh, and we, we joked about it. We said, I'll teach you two purples for a red, you know. Was, uh, 
Anyway, so finally we, we went down to, uh, from there we went to uh, Michigan State College and it was, we had something like 2,000 cadets there and, and we were taking courses and, and um, just regular courses uh, and um, that was, uh, that was a tough because the guy who, who ran the place, the top officer had been gone to, went to West Point. So it was, it was, it was, it was just like, it was white glove inspection, of course, and so forth and so forth. And when we marched, we couldn't even look at the girls. <laughs> Talk about tough, you know, anyway. So anyway, we ended up, and then we went down to San Antonio, and we were in classification, and got classified as a bombardier, a navigator, or a pilot, or enlisted man. I would say that maybe one third were washed out. See, the Army really needed a lot of enlisted men. See, they needed gunners, about nine of them, I guess, on each bomber, and they needed all these enlisted men for, for, um, to, for maintenance and for armors and things. And so uh, they kept, wa I don't think they washed out many bomber pilots because they needed so many bombers and pilots and they needed co-pilots, and but they sure washed out a lot of the fighter pilots. And if you didn't like the color of your eyes, you're flat washed out. And it was so, it was about 15 months of nothing but tough. It was really, it was uh, not one word of encouragement, except for one guy. I remember down in San Antonio, there was this black guy who was a, in, uh, dealing out in, in the kitchen and he was, gave food to us, and he was always upbeat, hey, boy, how, how's it going? And, uh, you know, he was the only one, all of the thousands of people, for 15 months that was even encouraging to us at all. So uh, we ended up, we hated the Army, but we didn't mind flying, well, that was fun, because he became part of your, you know, you're, you're really part of you. Uh, and again, very few, became fighter pilots. We were an odd, odd, odd breed. Um, for instance, I remember when we went to, uh, when we went to, uh, uh, from, from training, we were going to go overseas, and we were, um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that later on, but anyway, we got to, uh, we, <coughs> we, 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 uh, we're, well, I'll start off again. We, we were uh, stationed in, in Redmond, Oregon, flying P-38s and, and getting ready to go overseas. And finally, uh, we, we had a um, uh, uh, party. And we said goodbye to our instructors. And the instructors had been in Europe and they'd been in China and they'd been in, in the South Pacific and they'd fl they were all experienced pilots. And, and uh, they never let us salute them and so forth. They were just like our big brothers, but we really idolized these guys that had been in combat. And uh, so uh, we had this huge party, and uh, then they loaded us on these uh, trucks and took us to Portland, and then we put on a troop chain and, and then buses, and finally we ended up in, uh, in, in Monterey, in, in an area there. It was a little ruffle depot there near Monterey and, 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 um, and so um, uh, the, we got there and then there was this, uh, it was late at night and there was a major, there was a paddle foot and he, uh, he started saying, okay, dress right, dress, dress right, dress in the middle of the night where he wants us to dress right. So we kind of got in the, uh, and so he started giving orders and orders around. So some, Somebody finally said, and on they started throwing pebbles at him, see. <laughs> Who did that? Then we said, then we, then we started teasing him, see, and he's getting mad, and he's getting mad. And we started teasing, because we're going overseas, what the hell can they do to us, see? <laughs> so anyway, so uh, he said, you guys are restricted. You can't, cannot go in town tonight. The last thing we wanted to do was to go in town. All we wanted to do was to sleep. We just had this hangover from this huge party. We just wanted this to go. So we all went in town. We all we found a hole in the fence and we all went in, in town and we're wandering around and, and there's it was kind of dead, you know, because war was on. And so um, 
we, I remember there was, we walked up, I, there were three jeeps, we call them jeeps, the guys were just in the act of Fort Order was right close by, it was the largest, one of the largest training bases in the country, and I think the largest, and so we walked up to these three guys sitting there <coughs> on the curb, and I said, hey, you guys know when the bus leaves for Fort Ord? And they stood up and they saluted. And, and I said, well, what, what, are you, uh, what, are you, what are you doing with your arm? Well, we're saluting. Well, what are you saluting? You're saluting you. You're an officer. And we said, no, we're not. We're pilots. See, you don't have to, you don't have to salute. And they said, you're going to have a drink with us. You can't drink with officers. That's an order. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so in the background, I see these guys doing this. Thing. You get over here. We're going to have a drink with them. You understand? Yes, sir. So, so we go in and we teach them the Army song, the Air Force song, and we're having a big party. You see, you know, the bus is coming, so we jumped on the bus. And uh, so we go. Next morning, this major comes out, and he calls us up. And he chews us up and down. He's screaming at us. What happened? He said, the two-star general of Fort Ord called me and he said, keep your goddamn fighter pilots out of town, they're ruining our discipline. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, that was an example of, and another example was, uh, my girlfriend uh, had an uncle who was a intelligence officer <laughs> for a, uh, for um, a Dumbo outfit in the Philippines. And Dumbo, you know, flying boats and things. And, uh, and anyway, so uh, uh, I thought I'd go see him. So I checked out a P-38. I had my buddy uh, from Salt Lake City fly my wing, and we took off. And, and we got to, we were in Zamboanga at that time, which is southern tip of Mindanao. And, uh, and Samar was about halfway to Manila, uh, in Luzon. Anyway, so we, I called us shot smart tower. This is shot put red with two uncles, uh, landing instructions. And Roger shot put red on uh, runway so and so, and the wind is so and so. And so I said, uh, shot put red, uh, permission to make an army landing. Roger, make an army landing. Yeah. <laughs> so as you know, the the landing that the Navy had it was they had a, they had 45 to the downwind, and then make a downwind, and then make a final, and then they make the yeah, base length and final and land. And uh, it was kind of dumb because if the engine quit, see, they could never land. In fact, I was flying in Minneapolis, uh, P-51s there, and a uh, uh, some guy was flying a Navy jet, and his he had a flame out, and he got killed. He, he right there. So what we would do, and, and I don't know if they do it in today, but we would come along, and we'd be close. By the way, you never could touch the microphone. We very seldom used the microphone because the Japanese could hone in on you and know where you were, see, except when you're close, close to a landing. But uh, uh, any, anyway, so the, the flight leader would always wobble his wings. We, of course, we flew out real wide like this, see, so then we just slide in close, and then the element, and then the leader would fly right next to so forth. And then the flight leader would go up like this, and that means you get a trail, and you get a trail, and then he would peel off, see, well, here we, we, we go in echelon, and uh, our squadron, because we shot down Admiral Yamamoto, I don't know what, but we were right underneath each other, stacked underneath. So anyway, and we, and overseas, we cut down real low, maybe 20 feet above the ground, see the runway, if there are any holes in that seat. And then we'd peel up, and then you'd get your spacing and put your gear down, flaps and run. boom, 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 boom. And so anyway, um, I called and got permission to make an army landing. So Doug Hayward and I were maybe doing about 350. <laughs> a little bit hotter. <laughs> so we dived down and in about 10 feet of an inch, you turn. It looked like a loop. It was probably pretty close to a loop because in 350, you had to, you know, cut your airspeed. So, no, 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 no. report to base operations. See. So we, by the way, we had these flatter hats, you know, these, these soft bill hats in the back of our head, you know, a cigarette and our sleeves rolled up and we, we had a 45 on our hip and, and I think Aussie flying boots and, 
Anyway, we staggered, we swat slaughtered into this bird curl. See, he, it, was, it was the committee officer of some R. And of course, in the Navy, a bird curl is captaincy, and we were first lieutenants. So we walked in, hey, hey, Captain, just like he was just one rank above us, see? <laughs> and he was furious. I can still see him. His, his hands on his head, his face was red, and he was screaming, what do you mean by landing in my Maya field like that? <laughs> and, I, and I said, yeah, that's the way we make landings, you know? And um, anyway, he said, what's your name? So I put the name, gave my address, and so I get home to, after I get back to the base, the commanding officer said, what happened in Samara? I said, well, I asked for an army, we asked for an army landing and, and they gave us permission and he didn't like it. So <laughs> anyway, so we, we didn't have much care, much have respect for, for the Navy or we hated MacArthur. And uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, <coughs> we went from, like the training, we went to basic training no, we went from classification to free flight, and there we learned to uh, things like uh, uh, Morse code and I don't know, all that much stuff. But we didn't do any flying there. And then we went to primary flying school, and um, <coughs> my, oh, by the way, what the Army did was they needed all these pilots, so they got all these private instructors, all these private airfields around the country to take in and, uh, and teach, teach his, uh, American pilots how to fly. And so we were, um, um, I remember the, the, my first, my, my instructor, uh, I didn't know anything about, I didn't, I'd never been up on an airplane before. So he, so he gets up there and he, you have a stick here, of course, he moves his stick and hits you, you know. So he's hitting my knees and screaming at me, yelling at me, and, and, and I didn't know what, you know, I didn't know how to fly the airplane, to what I was doing, or I didn't even know, you know. Anyway, so uh, he finally, I, I could solo, and finally, I think it took me <coughs> like 15, 12, 12 hours to solo. Everybody else did it seven and eight. And uh, I'm fairly smart. And I'm, I'm very coordinated, but I don't know why. I guess because I, um, I don't know. But anyway, it took me a, one of the last, last guys to solo, and uh, yet I became one of, one of the best because I always got extra gunnery and so forth. So um, uh, he, he showed me how to make a, a how to spin an airplane. What you do, you, of course, you, you you pull the stick back and till the airplane stalls, and then you kick in one rudder, and then it flats goes, and this flat spins. You, and uh, the way you come out of it, as you probably know, you kick the opposite rudder and wait about one turn, and, and you pop the stick, and then it comes out. Well, I did that, and I put it in a spin, and, and I uh, kicked the opposite rudder, waited one turn, popped, and it kept spinning. I thought, well, maybe I didn't pop the push my <coughs> rudder in hard enough, see how. So next time, next time I really push the rudder in and I uh, pop the stick and it kept spinning. Well, maybe I didn't pop the stick right. So the next time, by the way, I'm getting closer to the ground, see everything. And, uh, uh, but I, I started at 5,280 feet, so I had quite a bit of room. Anyway, so we're spinning them and I, kicked in the rudder and waited one turn and popped the stick and upside down for spinning. <laughs> and I, I'm getting out of this airplane. So I got out and, and I waited till it spun by me and then I pulled this parachute and the D handle and the D handle was in the in the in the harness, you know, and pulled out and waited and nothing happened. And waiting, and waiting. Pretty soon a little voice says, <laughs> pull it again. And here's my guide or my guardian angel see, trying to save my life, and I argue. Can you imagine anybody come to argue with a, with a guardian angel? <laughs> and I said, it's not going to do any good. See, it, it stick it, the handle's way out. Pull it, boom, boom, and it opens, see. 
and my boots fell off, and the farmer found my boots, and that's how I got my nickname. Boot. Anyway, <laughs> but, um, it, it's kind of funny, except that uh, I'm, when you're free fall, you're going about 130 miles an hour, which is two miles a minute, uh, 60 miles an hour is a mile a minute. So, so you're actually going one mile in 30 seconds, see? And the parachute opened at 500 feet. So 500 feet is about one tenth of a mile. So one tenth of 30 seconds is 1,001, 1,002, 1,000, splat, I'm it, see? That's how close I came. So uh, during the war, uh, I didn't pray or anything. I didn't, we never had any church services. Uh, but we, um, uh, I, but the, it kept this. I remember we coming back from Borneo, and um, we were just four four P thirty eights, and and we looked at and, and we didn't have radar. We couldn't use it, you know, at long range, and, and so we were maybe a couple hundred miles from 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 Zambo, and uh, we looked down, and here's a hole in the cloud down there. Well, we don't know that this cloud kept continuing all the way back to Zamboanga, but if we could go through this cloud, and if it wasn't raining underneath, we could see it underneath, it, that would be a good... But the flight leader said, you guys stay here. He motioned us for stay here, the element leader and me. And while he and his wingman circled down, and they went through this hole in the cloud, and so we knew that they could, they could see underneath there. And um, anyway, so this idiot that I'm flying with, he turns over and I'm, I turn over and we go, I put the flaps down, die flaps, and I put my, bring the throttle back. He pulls away from me. Well, you know, you're taught to fly formation. So I pull the flaps up and give the throttle. We're going straight down and we hit this, what we call compressibility, with speed of sound, see. And at that speed, there's no, uh, there's no control. Uh, if you go through the, through the barrier, of course, then you can control the airplane, okay. But th right there at, at compressibility, or right there at speed of sound, there's no control. So this cane had as much <laughs> use <laughs> to, 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 to pull that nose up as, as that wheel that I had on the P-38. And so I reached up to gonna release the canopy, and um, and then I was gonna release the seat belt and stand up, and of course, I, I would have I've been a shark bait in about 30 seconds, you know, 600 miles an hour. See, I would have hit that horizontal stabilizer and been dead. And the little boy says, trim it. And again, I argue, see, here's the thing. I think I learned, no. I, I guess it's not going to do any good. See, there's no control. And this little boy says, trim it. I don't know if you know this or not, but the way these, you know what turns these great big sh troop ships, these great big ocean liners? A little dinky trim tab on the, on the, that's what turns this whole big huge airplane and uh, big ships. Well, the same thing with this airplane, see. But anyway, so I trimmed it, I pulled the wheel back, and um, I could see the nose go up. I could feel it go up a little bit. I could see it rise. So I thought, well, I better stick with it. And uh, it, it going, see, we're going 600 miles, and that's six. That's 10 miles a minute right now, right? 600 miles an hour. Okay, so, it, uh, and we're at 4,000, 20,000 feet, that's about four miles high. So, uh, so for, anyway, about 24 minutes, 24 seconds, yeah, 24 seconds, we're gonna hit the water. And, uh, but as we got a little closer to the water, of course the air is more dense, and I, I had the dive flaps down by this time. And uh, we just, uh, 660, just on uh, as we came over the ocean, came, got, so my life was saved two other times during World War II, twice during the Korean War, and twice since then. One was in a kayak on my, next to my river in, in Silverthorne. And I'm in this kayak, and I'd, I'd never been in a river before, and I turned over, well, you know, all you do is you, you, you turn the iron kayak over again. Well, I kept trying to pull this, try this, turn this kayak over, and I couldn't. Well, what, unbeknownst to me, this kayak had floated next to the riverbank, and this big bush he was keeping the kayak from rolling. And finally, this little boy says, 
get some air. Good idea. <laughs> so I tried to get some air, I couldn't. I tried again, I couldn't. And the third time I get all I could, I just, I, I just left up the cockpit a little bit, or you know, on this little kayak, and I got a breath of air, and then I busted out, and I haven't been in, I haven't been in a kayak since. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so um, we we, we uh, see something about our missions. We our missions were basically to uh, uh, help the the, the infantry. Um, by the way, the P-38, as you know, shoots straight ahead, and, and, the, and the gondola. Otherwise, other fighter airplanes, the guns are on the wings, and they would meet, and then and then couldn't it, and then cross. See, so P-38, uh, the Japanese were very, they knew about this, so we could lift up our and, and lob them all, and so they were they were very worried that they didn't like P-38. Uh, by the way, the P-38 was a uh, could outturn a zero. It could outturn a uh, a Spitfire. It could outturn ME 109, 190, any, anything. It could turn anything. The reason was the P 38 didn't stall like an ordinary airplane. It wouldn't hover, of course, but it, as you pull the nose up, it would just kind of back down like this. See, well, when you're when you're backing down, you can turn the airplane. And then you could just kick a rudder and cut a zero right in half. It was just so all you have to do, you get a Luffberry Luffberry circle, see, and the Luffberry circle, like, no one can shoot you down because you have to pull a lead. You have to put your, and of course you can't get everybody in the tight circle, see. But see the P thirty eight, you can go up and down uh, like in a wave, and then go up here and then, and you could turn. And so it was a, a really an interesting plane, and a nice comfortable one. It didn't have any torque, of course, because they're counter-rotating props, and we, in fact, we had this song that went like this, I'm a big, no, <laughs> uh, take me back to three eighths with the props that counter-rotate, oh my, I'm too young to die, I want to go home, I want to go home, I want to go home, the P-51 with its bullet-like dome, still can't feather up one and come home, so take me back to L.A., where all the war workers play, oh my, I'm too young to die. I want to go home, I want to go home. A fetus this mutton, this god-awful swell. See, because we were close to Australia, they didn't have to bring food all the way from the United States, but, so they gave us dead mutton. See. A fetus this mutton, this god-awful swell. If the nippers don't get us, the Aussie food will. So take me back to Melbourne. Oh, when they play that American corn, oh my, I'm too young to die. Fifty verses. Yeah. Anyway, one verse was, P-39 is not worth a dime, it just tumbled a buddy of mine. The P-39 was a terrible airplane. At any airspeed, 30 miles an hour, 300 miles an hour, you pull the stick back and it would go into a stall. And if you didn't pop the stick right away, it would go into a spin with Two spins, you're 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 dead. You're dead. See, and so uh, we 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 uh, we we trans we uh, flew. That so that was the first fighter plane we flew, the P-39, out of Victorville, California. Now half the class went to Ajo, Arizona, to shoot gunnery and P and T-6s, and uh, that's where you really learn how. To, I learned really learned how to fly because. You're, you're flying along, and you had to turn and 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 uh, and get within just within uh, range, and then you pull your trigger, and then you go underneath the target and go around and back up to your scope, your your flight again. See, so uh, and and they dip our machine gun bullets in wax in different colored wax. So as it would go through the target, and the target was about seven feet high about 30 feet long. And if it goes through the target, it would leave a hole, so you know who's, who's, who shot that was. And then they'd figure out, so uh, for some reason or other, I, I, I guess I'm good with uh, coordination and I can kind of see in three dimension, I'm, I'm a sculptor. And so anyway, uh, it was fairly easy for me. And uh, so, um, 
the the P30 what, well, I were, were, oh, and then after after you get you used up all your ammunition, then we'd have what we call a rat race. The, the flight leader would would, would you would get in trail and he would do a roll, you do a roll, he do a loop, you do you follow follow this guy in front of you, see, and it was always and it was fun to do because you go into a cloud, cumulus cloud with, with, with you know, and you little holes in the cloud, you that and usually you're flying up there, you don't know how fast you're going. But if you're the cloud there, you see, you can see how fast you're going. So we would do these rat races, and that, that's really how I learned how to fly. So then we got back to, to uh, Victorville. Nine kids had been killed while we were in the, while we were shooting gunnery. In nine days, see, nine kids killed in that P-39. And so, uh, but we had, again, I was a little bit better pilot after <coughs> shooting gunnery. Uh, but so then from, from Victorville, we went to Ephrata, Washington, which was, uh, you probably know where Moses Lake is, and very close to Ephrata, was close by there, and uh, that's where we were stationed. And, and uh, uh, with 39s again, see, and, and we lost 30 boys in 30 days, and this killed, see. So we're getting what we call planky, see. Uh, getting nervous and, and, and worried, and then of course, as soon as you do that, you, you, you're you're not uh, you're not normal, and you're not you're not sharp, and so uh, maybe one of the best speeches I ever heard in my life was there in, 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 in at Ephrata. We the old commanding officer kept threatening us. See, if you hurt the airplane, you have to pay for it. You have to wash you out. You have to go fly fly bombers, you know, nah, 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 nah. and so they got rid of him and a new committee officer, and I can still remember uh, that that speech he gave, and I can still remember the, the what it was like. And we were, all, our, all the second lieutenants were sitting out there in the uh, in the audience when the commanding officers were here, and he was talking, and he said, my name is so-and-so, Colonel so-and-so, I'm a major, maybe, uh, I'm the, your new CO. And then it was quiet. And then he said, you know, I understand you've had a few accidents. A few accidents? 30 guys, 30? So he said, uh, you know, uh, you're the best pilots that have ever been trained. No one has had the training you have had. Your instructors, right next to him, he had all the instructors there who had been overseas with all their medals. He said, all your instructors here are the best instructors in the world. They're teaching you how to fly. And he said, you know, the airplane is no good. It's a lousy airplane. You've got bailey wire and beer cans trying to keep the cool flaps open. And, and he said, it's a crappy airplane. And he quieted it. He said, you know what? There's a war on. They gave us a goddamn beer can. We're going to fly the son of a bitch. <laughs> but guess what? We didn't have another accident. It was because he gave confidence to us, see? And that's uh, this idea of tearing you down and reminding you, what's the old story? Is don't use don't use the word no because it means you can't hear that no. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. But anyway, so... Um, uh, from uh, from from Zampa, from uh, <coughs> from basic training. Of, uh, from, yeah, we went through training after we were going overseas, and um, we landed. And we didn't know where we were going. See, so once we got airborne, we could open up our orders. We we're going to a place called Nadzab, Nadzab, New Guinea, and uh, and so we. Uh, had to land in the, the, in, the, in the Hawaiian Islands, and then we we landed at a place called uh, Johnson Island, a little dicky island in the middle of the Pacific. And they actually had to dredge out and make the runway long enough to, to help airplanes. And then we went from there to uh, from, from to um, uh, anyway we landed and, and then we went from there to. Biak, which was a little island north of New Guinea, and uh, we were—it was at night, and we were, we were awake, waiting to land, and uh, the airplane made a violent 90-degree turn and bent right, 
and we didn't know what was going on, and, but when we, we soon found out that the airplane in front of us was a Betty bomber, a Japanese bomber, and, and they got, you know, it, it was night, and the lights on, they didn't know who it was, and they dropped all these frag bombs, and so when we landed, maybe three or four C-54s, and uh, maybe six P-38s were all dead and blood all over and beat wagons and people. And that was my uh, initiation to combat. Uh, we got to uh, board, we got to uh, Nazab. I think we stopped at Fort Moresby maybe before. Anyway, so here was jungle, see, in, 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 in New Guinea was hot. Yes, if you get up from this seat and go move over there, you're exhausted. And it was that bad, it was that hot and that humid. And these guys are fighting there. It was, can you imagine? Anyway, can't imagine. So, um, we, um, let's see, one, funny, some funny, oh, we, we were told to, um, we had to go out and take a uh, survival course out in the jungle. And our soldiers were Aussie, uh, Aussie uh, soldiers, and they, they, they call, we call them uh, jungle rats. And they looked like and they were dirty. And oh God, you know they'd been living on them. Anyway, they were telling us how to how to uh, cut the vines and, and which ones to drink. And if it were milky, don't drink it. If it and if uh, if you cut a vine and you taste it and it was spit, spit it out, and if it, it had a, a taste to it. it aftertaste, don't drink that. But there were some vines all over the place. And so, uh, it was, they showed how to build little huts and how to make traps and so forth for animals so you could survive. And one of the guys that were in, in the pilots that were going through this survival training said, say, are, are there any snakes here? <laughs> These Aussies look at each other. Well, I wouldn't worry about snakes, Mike. For every one you see, one hundred say you. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the guy was probably scared of snakes, and that's why I asked him. Anyway, that was kind of funny. Um, so I remember uh, uh, I had to get my flight hours. If I didn't get my fly time, I'd get my lose my flight pay. You see, so I, I said I've got to get flight. So you can fly the P forty seven. Well, usually when you fly an airplane, they had to have you read the manual, and then they had to know all about the emergency procedures, and they blindfolded you to you know where everything was in the cockpit. And it took a couple of weeks, you know, to be able to be able to fly an airplane. And so I'm down there, and they, I walked, jumped into this P-47. You know, the P-47, big, big, huge towel, you know, big, huge, it's a huge airplane. It's a leaky cockpit. Anyway, uh, so. Um, I said, how do you start this thing? And the crew chief started it, and I said, where's the, where's the gear handle over there? Where's the uh, gear, where do you put the flaps there? there? So I took off. <laughs> 30 <laughs> seconds take off. Well, what was really funny is, of course you can't see, you know, you have to look out the side to see for the runway. So it, it took off. And immediately I knew that it was a good airplane because it was really, really easy to fly. Really, you do lot. I could have done a roll and take it out. I wouldn't have been very so easy. And uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't climb over the dime. See, in fact, that was one of the the P forty seven is also now over the dime. It damned it. It was hard and grown, but be damned if it would climb. Yeah. Anyway, but it was a great one of the best airplanes in the World War Two for close support. See because that huge engine was, was uh, saved a lot of lives. And while they didn't use it in Korea, I don't, I don't know. Because outside of, well, every time we'd fly to Yuma, Arizona, from Minnesota, we'd go through uh, uh, Salt Lake City and there'd be thousands of these P-47s all cocooned. They could have easily <coughs> took them, take them over to, to, uh, to Korea. Uh, but anyway, so this one time I'm flying the, the P-47 and, and I landed and, and I'm waiting to cross the runway to go park the airplane. And in comes this P-51. And um, I'd never seen one that close before. And, and it came in and he made a 360 overhead. And um, 
I can, I, I kept saying, give him a throttle, give him a throttle. I know you need to give him a throttle. Of course, he couldn't hear me, you know. But anyway, and just, he gave him a throttle just before he touched down, see. And what happened was one wing <laughs> caught and the other didn't. So his wing hit about 10 feet in front of my airplane, see. And cartwheels down. He's doing 100 miles an hour cartwheeling down, see. And wing, you know, nose, wing, tail, nose, and, and, and so I roared across and, and parked my uh, 47 and I jumped in the Jeep and told the crew chief to shock it and I got down there and all there's left is his cockpit. Luckily it's right side up, see. And he's white. <laughs> he looks, <laughs> he looks, and he's saying that. And no nose, no wings, no tail, just his cockpit. So I go like this and he, and he opens the cockpit and it works. And that lucky, yeah. Anyway, so that's that was the closest uh, I've seen. <coughs> um, How about the one where you were training? You with the Marine and the... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so um, <coughs> when we were stationed in Zamboanga, my girlfriend told me that her girlfriend, she had a girlfriend, has a boyfriend that was a Marine pilot in Zamboanga. I want to look him up. So I looked the guy up, and his name was Bill Owen. Nice guy. I'll tell you, he was a nice guy. He was a teetotaler. <laughs> and the, this is kind of neat because it, it goes back to the Revolutionary War that the U.S. Navy has to supply every Marine officer with two drinks once a week. <laughs> so every Friday, they would give these, the Navy would have these stateside booze. We didn't get any stateside booze. We had the Filipino well, uh, awful. Anyway, so I'd go down and drink Bill's allotment for liquor, see? <laughs> and so it was really a, a, a neat arrangement. Anyway, so uh, uh, one day, uh, one night, one Friday night, he said, hey, we're having a big a big, um, big mission tomorrow, and why don't you uh, uh, why don't you come and, and hear the lecture and uh, your clues for, clue for secrets here. Sure. So I go down there and hear this two-star admiral tells this big huge uh, story about the, uh, <coughs> on the island of Hilo, which is very close to Zamboanga, maybe an hour away. And the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Japanese had uh, captured or stopped this truck and killed the driver and his assistant and taking the supplies, see. So they were, the Navy was very mad because, uh, and we didn't know the Japanese were on this island because the people that lived on the island were Moros and they didn't like the Christians, they didn't like the Filipinos, they didn't like the Americans, and they didn't, you know. And so they, they didn't tell us that the Japanese were there on their island. So that's what this mission was about. So the Navy was gonna go in, the Marines, and our three squadrons of P-38s, so how come I didn't hear about this, this big important mission? And uh, so I got home and I looked at the, uh, who scheduled, I'm scheduled to fly. So the next morning I get up and, and we go to Hilo. That's all I said, we go to Hilo? We don't have to carry belly tanks. Yay, we were really happy to uh, go, go over to seven hour missions. This is how. So anyway, we take off and uh, I noticed there was this B-25 it was colored blue, it was fly around, so that's what the general hood, sure Admiral was in, and he was flying around watching all this. And so uh, you, you can imagine the Navy went in and the Marines went in and low level, the, and the P-38s, uh, again, 16 airplanes, three times three, three squadrons, wobble their wings, getting them tight, and then peeling off and getting the spacing, and diving down, taking turns, and uh, dropping and drop their bomb, and then uh, bombs, and then and then uh, strafing, vertical strafing, shape, straight down, and then and then we pulled off. We we rat race for a while. See, wait till our next turn came, and then we then we go. So you can imagine these three air, three flip squadrons, uh, dropping their bombs, and then rat racing around. And around. <laughs> it must have been pretty pretty interesting to watch. Anyway, so uh, next Friday I go down to get my liquor allotment, see? <laughs> and uh, Bill says, do you hear what happens? Said, no, what happens? Said, well, this Navy 
admiral was there in a B-25 watching this whole thing, and he said the Navy didn't do anything, the Marines didn't do anything, but this vertical strafing, they found 1,200 Japanese, not one survived. So anyway, uh, we, we, we were very uh, frightened and scared you know, of flying because when somebody's shooting at you, it, that's one thing, but it's flying around you know, in the United States or somewhere. It's, you know, but uh, when somebody's shooting at you, you're amazing how quick you, how alert you become. And uh, we, uh, we could, uh, uh, I remember when I came home from from uh, from the war, and I hadn't played tennis in something like six years, or three or four years, and I was playing tennis with my brother. I knew where he was going to hit the ball before he even hit it. It was just you had the sixth sense, see, of survival that you got in combat, and um, so that I think that's one reason why we all look back at our time in the army in the in in in, in, in combat. And uh, we're, we're thankful because it gave us an idea of what we can be, see. And, and uh, uh, so anyway. Um, Pretty good. Yeah. Can I take questions? Yeah, any yeah. questions at all? Yeah, no questions? Oh, yes, okay. Yeah, oh, sure. You might be interested in, yes. How many confirmed kills in the aircraft do you have? How many confirmed kills do you have in the well, aircraft? Uh, uh, we, we didn't have any confirmed kills. Uh, I will tell you one story. Oh, by the time we got over there, the Japanese didn't have any gas. They didn't have any airplanes. So it was basically all troop support. Yeah. And uh, by the way, once we got on the airplane, uh, then you no longer were frightened. You no longer you knew what you could do. So you knew. And uh, I remember my friend from of Salt Lake City, he would get in his airplane, and of course the crew chiefs always idolized their pilots. And, and uh, a anyway, so 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 Doug would get in his airplane, and he he'd go like this, and he'd start that engine, start this engine, and then he'd go like this, pull the chops, and then he'd go, "Fuck you, guys!" <laughs> <laughs> and they'd laugh, you know, because <laughs> he knew he was going to die. See, anyway. Uh, but once you, uh, it was waiting, uh, waiting the next day for the next next mission. The next mission. Can you imagine these guys in in, in the Pacific or the German pilots for something like four years? Yes. No, didn't you? Weren't you a wingman and you landed on an island just mm -hmm. after the war? You landed on an island where there was a lot of American um, prisoners. Oh yeah. <coughs> the. Um, my, my sister in here. <laughs> anyway, anyway um, uh, at the end of the war, we were, oh, this is kind of interesting. At the BJ and I, the, uh, we all shot our pistols in the air and we ran over to the officer's club and the flight surgeon had all this booze, you know, that he gave us a shot of liquor after every mission. We had these box, so we, he donated that to the party, and we cut it with pineapple juice, and we used it for a wash. Uh, it was a Filipino whiskey, see, so it was part. It was, oh, anyway. Um, so a little boy says, go to your tent. Go to my tent? Hey, you saved my life, yeah, yeah, but go to having a party. Go to your tent. So I went to that tent, and I staggered into my boat. And here, lying in the ditch, was the committee officer. <laughs> here, bowls coming up. To <laughs> and so I fished him out of this, out of this ditch, and, and revived him. And, and I lectured to him, you know, you must go home. You must not fall in these ditches. <laughs> and so I aimed him towards the sand. He went <laughs> four times. I dragged him out that damn ditch. <laughs> and finally, I put him to bed. And the next morning, he remembered. What do they have? The MOS or what do they call the thing? They their yearly re, re thing you have to. They they tell them how great you are, what you did. I got a good a good year that year. <laughs> 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 anyway, 
So then, uh, <coughs> then they started shooting our airplanes down over Formosa and over uh, Korea. And uh, so we were sent from South America now the 70th up to the 67th Fighter Squadron in Leao Gluzon, which is the northernmost air base up there. And so uh, we went roaring up there and uh, joined the squadron and uh, we're going to, we're hot guns. Even though the war had ended, well, the ceasefire had, 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 but not the peace had been sent. But anyway, so we had orders to shoot down any Japanese airplane that we saw over from home. So we were really eager. Because, oh, God. So we, four P-38s go around over there, and we started counting. <laughs> we counted something at 800 Japanese airplanes. <laughs> 800 against four? <laughs> anyway, so we get braver and braver and get lower and lower and lower. And, and I thought, I know, I'll start taking pictures. So, I, and as you know, there was a switch there. You push it up and you get camera. And, and then you push it down and you get, you know, you get gun and camera. See. And I push it up and take pictures of, of these pagodas. And, uh, and I do a roll on the deck with a P-38. See. And I had these marvelous pictures of all rolls and, and, and the pagodas. And they have these temples and these gates outside of the East Hall City in, 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 in uh, Formosa or Taiwan. They have these gates, Chinese gates, they have to roll. And they have pictures up there. Uh, um, working in the rice fields and things. And so we get to uh, Taipei and we look down and here are Tonys, a bunch of in line, they're called, uh, they were Japanese airplanes that uh, that were all in a row, all lined up next to the runway. Uh, by the way, uh, I had a friend who was in the uh, Fifth Air Force and he, he, was, he went into Japan after the war and he said that the Japanese, the, he talked to a major who was in the Air Force, the Japanese Air Force, and this Japanese major said that they had 2,000 airplanes, fueled and armed. We would never have made that landing. Uh, I tell you what, MacArthur, they, they, they would have been cashiered out of the Army. Uh, it, it, it was, it would have been, a, and they knew where we were going to land, and they had tunnels in there, and every, every Man, woman, child had a spear, you know, a bamboo spear was going to kill an American. It was it was awful, see. And um, uh, so we. And by the way, our, our squadron was on the way to Okinawa. And so anyway, uh, I had a friend in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, he was a lawyer. I think his ancestors signed the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. I don't know, but anyway, he was in MacArthur's staff. And he said, any story you hear about MacArthur is true. <laughs> and, then, and then he said, I found out what the day was that we were going to invade. And you know, they had a, they did have a date, see, because they had to back up and bring all the troops and the food and the armor and the, get the ships all together. And, and so, and guess what happened on that day? A hurricane hit Okinawa and flattened Okinawa. There wasn't a tent, there wasn't a building left. And you know what? That's what's, that's, so the Japanese all prayed, just like they did in the 1400s. Remember when the Japanese uh, the Kupla Khan was going to come out there and invade Japan with his, and, and, and this divine wind came, this kamikaze wind came and wiped out the fleet and, and saved Japan? Well, the Japanese were going to do that again. And it happened on the same day. Can you imagine? So I don't know. Maybe we should all start praying. For I don't know. Okay. Anything else? Any last questions? Thank you. Questions? Can you describe the significance of the patch on your right arm? Patch on your right arm. Hmm? The significance of that? What is it? The um, 13? red and white flag oh. with the oh, that's, star. Oh, that's what if you flew over China, um, then they had a uh, some script they gave us and we could, but basically this meant that we were flying over China and, uh, and this is the 13th Air Force, the Jungle Air Force and this is my original squadron uh, um, emblem the White Knights instead of the Blue Dragon, see we have the White Knights <laughs> yes 
I have a question. At, um, <coughs> well, two. One, it's um, his most uh, memorable mission. I think for you, if you don't mind just giving your perspective as a daughter growing oh. up, oh. your dad being gone, like for you, sure. what's your what's your most memorable mission? <coughs> How about when you landed on that island in the prisoner of war? Was that kind of? No, I think that one. I guess I didn't tell you that. The the uh, when we got close to Taipei, we looked down and here these Tonys were all in a row, right? And so my flight leader tightened up and then he got them. So we peeled off and we went down in front of these, in front of these all these Tonys, see? And um, I thought, gee, this could be a good picture. So I pushed the damn mud down. I guess because the Japanese planes were there. I don't know why, but subconsciously, I put this up. So as I turned around and got lined up, I pulled my, put my camera on, and these bullets came roaring, roaring out of them. But luckily, it shot straight ahead, see? And the bullets went right in front of all these Tonys. I didn't hit a single one. But on the wing, left wing, was the, was the pilot. Well, maybe he was a crew chief, I don't know. But I piled like this. And of course, when they, when they heard, and they they dive off their wings, see, it looked like the aqua follies. <laughs> 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 and and uh, I didn't hurt a single one of them uh, with my bullets, but it was it was kind of embarrassing, you know. They got you know, the war is over, and I scare all these guys. <laughs> okay, so so I, I I may be not the world's uh, best uh, war ace, but the war ass. <laughs> <laughs> I was at six, 30 airplanes that shot down, 30 pilots shot down in about 10 seconds. You see. <laughs> what he didn't tell you was he landed on, a, on an island, he was the wingman, and it was a prisoner of war camp, and it was the day after, uh, I think, the Oh, oh yeah. Son. Okay, so the, then the commanding officer uh, got, got this hot shot little guy from California, he, he was a really hot pilot. He loved to go and, and fly a P-38 and he'd, he'd, he'd feather <coughs> both engines, see? And then he, like a glider, he'd die and do rolls and all this stuff without any engines. They'd start the engines and land. So anyway, he was my wingman. And the flight leader, the, the uh, commanding officer, I don't know why he picked me, but anyway, the. Uh, he had on his wing. He had some guy that was a uh, uh, had been in the merchant marine and spoke a couple words of Japanese, and so uh, we we were told to land in Taipei, and that was I guess the most amazing, uh, memorable mission because the commanding officer landed and the wingman landed and, and then we circled overhead at about 90 feet at about 90 miles an hour, sagging around with full flap. And uh, they could have picked us off with the 22, of course. See? And they came out with a samurai sword. Oh, by the way, there was a rumor was that they, the Jap Japanese commander, treated all the sp all prisoners as spies and beheaded them all. And uh, I had two close friends, one, one of my best friends from Iowa, the nicest guy you ever met, and uh, he. He uh, didn't come back from a mission over for Formosa, so he was probably beheaded. Anyway, so they came out with a samurai sword and gave it to my 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 commanding officer, and um, and then and then I knew he'd be okay. So my wingman and, and I flew back to the Philippines. There were only 19 left, 19 prisoners left in all of Formosa, and they were to be killed the day of the of the ceasefire. So they are glad we didn't uh, drop, we dropped the bomb because it would have taken, you know, certainly a long time to go through a peace treaty. Mm -hmm. Great. And then um, he asked me a question. So I'm just really proud of my dad, and I always try to do the best I can. I think dad always rose to every occasion, and that's what I try and do. And um, he was always on the edge, so we lived on the edge. He thought he had three boys, and he had three girls. <laughs> so in France, I'd be on the front, he'd be, we'd be bicycling in Poitiers, he was teaching English on base, and we went down a hill, 
too fast, no brakes, and we just did this beautiful triple flip. And that's just a typical, and I was like three, four years old, thinking that's normal. And then we went skiing in Berch's garden, and because he was military, we could stay at the uh, beautiful hotel where Hitler, the Eagles Eyrie, and it was $2 a night. So we had <laughs> Christmas there. And my first experience skiing was he had these long black skis, they're head skis, right? And he's six foot seven, and here I am. And, I, and he goes, just jump on my boot and grab my knees. Okay, Dad, okay, okay. And he shushed the head wall. He shushed. That was my first skiing experience was just was white and these little black tip skis. And then I went on to ski, teach skiing in New Zealand. But that's my dad. I love you, dad. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, we have a few things to give you to, for, to show our gratitude for your um, coming to speak with us here. So, sir, would you like to say something? Yes. So, sir, and in Thank you so much for taking the time for being here. Uh, we really appreciate just uh, being here and sharing your stories with uh, with this generation. Uh, as I mentioned when we were talking, I feel like a lot of it has changed, but the spirit continues to be the same. Uh, I see the young crews still flying their mission. The challenges, a lot of them continue to be the same, but their service to their country, it is still the, the, the same, you know? So. Uh, thank you. I guess I just small card. Well, thank you very much. Thank from, you. From all I mean, thank you so much for, for being here thank as well. You. It's an honor. Thank you. This bicycle. What happened was I had this French a French bicycle, and I had this little seat for her sister seat, and then she wanted to ride. And then what happened? We were fl driving along and flying, and really going about forty miles an hour. And the sprocket stress seat, and the and the and then the tire stopped. So we went straight overhead, and I put my hand out to to break it, and and, and I, I rolled, and put and she was inside, and she she never touched the pavement, but doing about thirty miles, forty miles, and stopping. I don't know how they talk about reaction. I put my arm out, and then I rolled, and she never touched it. That's what happened today. I, 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 I don't have that reaction anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, sorry to do one more, but uh, mm -hmm. just to close, any advice that he would give to our young air crew, looking back from everything that he has seen as they train and prep to do the, the next set of missions, what's their main advice? Anything you would recommend <coughs> to the young, the young people here on how they should prepare for... Um, I, I didn't, uh, because, because my life has saved eight times, I think there's another extrasensory world out there. And I think that, uh, that by the way, have you, have you all heard about the left hand torsion? You ever heard of that? No? Anyway, since, since I, I said, okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, well, anyway, I just, I was going to say that. I, I recommend everybody to meditate, do what they can to help bring up consciousness, rise consciousness in the world, and um, and, you, and you do matter, you know, you do count. Okay. Thank you.